And Amy, for you, I mean, obviously, Patton is so charming. Is it hard to sort of be the voice of reason? And <laughs> I mean, I, I he, yes, he's also one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Obviously, he's a professional comedian, but um, but I've been around other professional comedians that I don't think are as funny as Patton. He really yes. delivers. Yeah. Can we make a clip of this and just put some shit <laughs> on the tag website? Can we just do this little clip? That'd be great. Thank you. Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Janelle Riley from Variety. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the stars of I Love My Dad, Pat Oswalt, James Morosini, Claudia Saluski, and Amy Landecker. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. This is an audience of your fellow actors. Um, so I actually always love to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? What was the job? that brought that that very meaningful piece of paper to you. Um, and let's start with Amy. I, um, it was for, I think it was Toyota. Um, Rochester Toyota is gonna win you over. And I was like the girl on the car who like, you know, like leaned on the car and walked around the car. And it was a good, here's a little lesson for actors out there. My audition was so bad. I screwed up a ton, but I kept laughing and the client said they liked my personality. So even though I screwed up a lot, that's kind of my, my, my letting it go and just going with the flow got me the job. So it's, it was always something I remembered, like, it's okay to screw up. Just how you handle it might help in the end so that's my little life james for you gosh i uh i think it was a co-star on heart of dixie uh and i was playing a drunk like towns person uh and i said my line was that's not a taser it's a garage door opener uh (laughs) and, and i was very i was trying to connect with the director about how drunk I should be, one to 10, (laughs) really trying to get a sense of who this guy is. For the audition, I was terrified. I I remember calling someone afterwards being like, I'm never auditioning again. I'm terrible at this. And I got the job. And then I got a call from my manager uh, a couple of weeks later being like, hey, so they're going to cut your seer line. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, and so here we are. <laughs> wow. But it, but it still got you the card. Even though they lost your line, it got you the card, That's right? right. I, got, I got the card. Yes. And, uh, and, I, and I've and i been practicing that line ever since. <laughs> I've, I've almost got it. I've almost got it. Please work that into a movie someday so we'll all know. Mm-hmm. A little uh, Easter egg. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Claudia, for you? Um. The project that got me a SAG card was this show called Tagged um, that is on Hulu. It's it's sort of like a high school drama horror mystery um, that shot in New Mexico. And so I got just thrown right into the summer camp energy. It was one of like the most fun experiences. We, we None of us really knew what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I was playing a mean cheerleader, and that was the role. <laughs> That's uh, fantastic. Happy for you. Um, man, this is how long I've been doing it. I got my after card for a TV show and then my SAG card for a movie. So this was before the oh, wow. two, they joined forces. So my after card, I was on an episode of Seinfeld where I played a video store clerk who uh, Costan- George Costanza is trying to rent Breakfast at Tiffany's. And I won't rent it to him. And the way that I got the job was um, in the audition. And I auditioned for Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld in the room. Um, when the when the Costanza character is bothering me, I guess I subconsciously called on my years of retail work. And I and Larry David has said this to me since then. He was like, you subtly started looking around for another employee to hand him off to, which is what people in retail do when you have a bad customer, like, how do I get, and it made, because it made him laugh so much because that's what he would do as a retail guy. So my old bad retail instinct got me my after card. And then my SAG card was um, the movie Down Periscope, uh, where I, um, I'm, the, I'm the radio operator in the background. And my line is, there's a call for you, sir, Admiral Graham. And that was, there was my line and they didn't cut it. Because he's a better actor than James. <laughs> Clearly. Well, look how far you've all come now. I love this. Um, Wouldn't it be funny if we were like, oh, I don't have a SAG card. Was I, am I, I, 
It's SAG. happened. It's Wait, happened. I'm sorry. What's it? You, SAG. What, what is a SAG card? Hang on. Let me go on Wikipedia. I didn't pay my dues. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's happened before. Where I bet it has. I bet it has. While mm-hmm. I'm here in the building, I'll pay my dues. <laughs> <laughs> Again, congratulations on a fantastic movie. Um, I guess we should start with James because this really does all begin with you. In addition to being the co-star of the film, you're the writer, director, uh, you probably did the craft services. (laughs) And obviously I know all films are autobiographical to some degree, but this this story really happened to you. Um, At what point did you start thinking about this as a movie and, and how did you know you want to approach it from the father's point of view? So when I discovered that my dad had created this profile as a way of making sure I was okay, I remember being very upset and very, I I was devastated, but I've always loved comedy and I've always loved stories. And I, I think a part of me was also upset by the fact that I didn't know how I could ever share this story with anyone else, but I knew that I needed to. And just me anecdotally conveying it to people that I knew in my life wasn't going to do it justice. But I just I I just knew that it was a crazy thing to ha- for someone to do. And and so um, I don't know, years and years later, uh, you know, that, that was probably that was that was a long, long time ago. But I and I'd forgotten about it. And then years later, I was walking in New York and m- with my dad and he reminded me of it. And I was like, I just love the idea of someone doing something so wrong, but for the right reasons. And the question that it poses to an audience, which is how far would you go to make sure your child was OK? I, that's one of the questions. And also what you know, w- what do you do when you know you've done wrong, how do you try and make that right? Or how, can you change, you know? Um, but I, I wanted to explore it from my dad's perspective because I really wanted to try and understand his position and our relationship better. And I wanted to hopefully grow from writing this and, and making it. And I mean, do you think that'll happen? Was it cathartic for you? I think it was cathartic. I think it's, I think growth is just an, it's an, it's an ongoing process. I don't think it's something you arrive at. I think forgiveness is also something that comes in stages and, and, and like in different layers of, of depth, I guess. Uh, so I, I think it was cathartic and it, it continues to be, and it, it, it continues to be kind of an ever evolving experience, uh, mm-hmm that I'm having with this film. Well, for the actors, I would love to know sort of how the project found its way to you and what interested you in your roles and the part and the project. Um, And starting with Patton, uh, when you received the script, did you know what it was about? Um, Did you have preconceived ideas of of what it was going to be or did you just start reading it? My agent sent it to me with no log line, no um, praise or breakdown. I just started reading this thing. He, all he said was, it's really weird, but I think you'll like it. And uh, about halfway through, it really had the quality of movies that I really love, which is how are they going to pull this off? I love movies where you you know that at some point during its conception, there were there must have been times and I don't want to speak for James. There must have been times when he was writing it where he was like, I can't do this as a how in the fuck. So any kind of script that pushes through those doubts and those fears and 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 become something so solid, you, it has to get out there in the world. So, you know, th- that that quality alone is what really excited me about it. Did that intimidate you, though, as an actor? Because you, you talk about reading it and thinking, how is he going to, did you ever think like, how is an actor, am I going to make this guy not seem like a sociopath? Well, yeah, that was also very, um, th- there is a, when, if you're the lead actor in a story like this, you are walking the tightrope because the audience has to, they don't necessarily have to like you, but they have to either not even understand you. They have to at least go, I'm interested enough in this horrible person to want to spend 90 minutes with them. And you've got to really figure out where that person lives and make him or her um, a a real living person for whoever's watching it. So yeah, there is, there was a lot of that pressure and intimidation, but I was very, very lucky. I had really good direction from James and I had really good scene partners with um, with James, with um, uh, Claudia and, and especially with Amy, who, you know, Amy is this is playing the 
hey, I'm actually cool, too. And you're such a fuck up that you're making me have to be the uncool person or the world burns down. And and when you realize that that's kind of how you are, it makes it very easy to find the space, the delusional space that this character has to live in. Um, so that was I very much lucked out. I find Chuck very sympathetic, honestly. I find him, him in, incredibly relatable, and uh, maybe that's just me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Was that? <laughs> I've done some stuff. <laughs> well, I think everyone has been in the position, um, and and I that's one thing I related to. Everyone's been in the in the position where they're like, wait a minute, I don't get credit just for wanting to do the right thing. I have to actually follow through and do it. I think we've all made that mistake in our lives. And so that is a very, very uncomfortably relatable thing. Yeah. Amy, for you, what was your initial impressions of the script? Um, I, my, I have this wonderful comedy agent in New York, Ayala Cohen, who came from Saturday Night Live and she flagged James to me. She said, you know, this, I'm going to be honest. And James knows this. She said, it's not the most exciting part in the film. (laughs) it's not the big funny. (laughs) I mean, I really did find her. I really had an amazing time and I found fun in her, but I, you know, she wasn't flashy like these other three. She said, but this guy, I feel like is a really important comedic voice. And I watched his shorts that um, he made, which were similar in tone to the absurdity and self-deprecation of this film. And I think when you have an artist who has such a singular vision and then to add that it's a personal story and, you know, I mean, I always joke with him. I'm like, you look like a model, but you can write and act and you can play these like really hard characters. And, you know, it's like the Michelle Pfeiffer thing where you've just been blessed with way too much. Um, And, uh, but I, I, I knew at the table read the three of these red the I got to sort of watch them read this the, for the first time. And I had goosebumps on goosebumps. And I was like, oh, my God, this is this actually works, um, which is really hard to do because Claudia's character is a figment through so much of the film. And the fact that the all these three actors were able to navigate that sort of, you know, f- not reality, but it feels like reality. It's just kind of incredible um, anyway. So. It's a great story, too, obviously. (laughs) You just said something that I love, which is, um, you know, maybe it wasn't the flashiest role, but you you love the overall project. I'm curious in general when you when you uh, something speaks to you, is it about the role or is it about, you know, serving the overall story or maybe it, it varies from project to project? You know, Michaela Watkins is a friend of mine. She always says it has to like tick a couple of boxes. She's like, you have to, is you can't, it's not all, any project is very rarely all the things. So you're either looking at money, <laughs> you're looking at the people you're working with or the part that you're playing. And it needs to be two out of three. And most importantly, there has to be some level of excitement overall on, on top of that. I mean, to have the privilege to choose is not anything I ever thought I'd come to, like, I used to just take anything that you ever gave me. And now I am in that phase of my life and my career where I'm like, is this interesting? Does it say something I want to say? Or are you paying me a lot of money? Which (laughs) That's usually not the case. Um, Usually it's so, yeah, I mean, it definitely um, it definitely helps when it's saying something. And I, too, totally relate to Patton's character and have incredible amounts of compassion for him. And I mean, and it's Patton, too, who brings that the humanity that he brings to that guy. I watched this with my dad in Chicago. My dad was sobbing, sobbing uh, during a part of the film, could barely speak to anyone afterwards. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is like deeply moving and about healing, ultimately, you know, so I'm down for that. (laughs) <laughs> and Amy, you, you touched on something that I want to explore more with with Claudia, because the role of Becca, it, it's really several roles. You're you know, you're playing Becca as seen by Chuck, but then as imagined by Franklin and also imagined by Frank by Chuck. Like, I don't even know how you kept track. Um, what did you what was your sort of your initial response to this script and, and what interested you in Becca? Oh, gosh. Well, my um, my introduction into this project was very standard in terms of self-taping and auditioning. And so really for me, the celebration point was 
earning the role and and being able to accept this into my life and get really, really stoked and geeked out about it. And exactly to what you're saying, there were just so many layers and fun avenues to take Becca down. And I think also when I read the script, it, it really, it takes you through such a roller coaster in the same way that watching the movie does. But of course, you're kind of forced to use your imagination and think, how the hell is this going to happen? How is this going to be shot? How is it going to feel and seem? Um, and, and how are the performances going to add to all of this? Because some of those scenes written on paper are a pretty wild concept. <laughs> and, you know, you throw in all this incredible talent and, and the right scoring and the right editing. And um, I feel like we just looked out with the best people and like, just the juiciest, richest story and the best um, director, writer, star to spearhead the whole thing. And so for me, I would just, the second I got the call, I was, I was celebrating. <laughs> I just felt so lucky to, to get to be a part of this. Can I ask a really like specific actory question um, did, for your script? Did you like, how did you differentiate like which Becca we were seeing? Or maybe you're, maybe you're just so good. You can keep it straight in your head. Yeah, I I mean, I once we flew out to New York, I had so much time that first week during rehearsals to kind of break apart each scene and think, okay, what place is she speaking from? And through that, it was fun to also imagine fake Becca having this consciousness and how every single scene she she knows a little bit more about Franklin and she gets a little richer in her life experience and and that really played into some of the later scenes where you're kind of watching her either malfunction like a robot because Chuck is you know typing all these typos and and looking at that as sort of like the death of fake Becca that she's no longer <laughs> even functioning and and really showing that she's just a figment of imagination she's not real um and um specifically with sort of finding what characters to pull I mean that was really reflective of what's kind of simultaneously happening so with the bathroom sexting scene so much of that was Erica coming through the sexual confidence that Chuck's girlfriend has um and so I think the script really kind of informed that most and then it was fun to just add little sprinkles of whatever other inspirations. I just didn't even realize till you said that, that you also play Rachel Dratch in this movie. <laughs> she plays so many characters. She plays the real Becca that we see. Then she plays the initial Becca, which is just Chuck saying hello. Then she plays the fantasy idealization of what Franklin wants her to be. Then she plays the dirty Erica version of Becca, then malfunctioning Becca. Like it's, it, it's, the she plays a fake character that has a character arc. Like it's it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I it's, and I'm guessing because I know that this was an independent film that you were playing probably multiple characters on one day. Oh, for sure. S shooting mm -hmm. schedules are always all over the place, and it all depends on the location. And so, exactly, you're throwing on a bunch of different hats um, to bang out all these scenes at one location. So that's the way it goes, for sure. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the cast of this movie is is so fantastic. And, I, you know, we haven't even mentioned, well, we mentioned Rachel Dratch, but Lil Ray, Rel Howery, who's becoming one of my favorite actors on the planet, and Ricky Velez. Um, there's so many great actors. And so much of it does hinge on all of your chemistry, uh, negative and positive, if that makes sense. Um, I'm sort of curious if that, you know, developed pretty naturally. Like, James and Pat, and I, I believe you guys worked together, maybe even like, uh, going over scenes, Patton, I think was it was sort of your idea to, for James to play this role. Yeah, I mean, we we I know that we were we were looking at some younger actors, but then it hit me just because I have friends who have teenagers who are going through some problems. But a lot of the things they are told is, well, teenagers are supposed to have problems that because they're trying to figure out who they are. You have to let them kind of go through their thing. So I thought it meant I thought it made it a little more dire if James is a little bit older and there's that unspoken guilt of my shittiness kind of made um, Franklin miss his teenage years. And now he's someone who is maybe headed into his 30s, who is has a big chunk of his life blasted out of him. And I'm responsible for that. It makes it more immediate. I think a lot of people watching the film, if it had been a younger actor playing Franklin, they would have said the father should leave him alone to go through his shit. 
Um, and, and older Franklin is you better step in and do something because this could this could become permanent. And I thought that that was, you know, that it just came to me when we kept going over the scenes together. Um, and also just how good James was when we were and our rapport together was so good. Our our non rapport was so good, because if you notice, I love how a lot of the scenes with like between Amy and James, it's a mother and son. And then when I show up, it's like this force shield drops because he doesn't want to be around me and his whole demeanor changes mm. and it really works. Is it hard though, James and Amy to, to put up that shield around America's sweetheart, Patton Oswalt? <laughs> it's impossible. I, I can't, I can't put up a shield for, for oh. Patton. So I, I, you know, uh, no, you know, it, it, I was, I was really trying to channel um, those moments where you feel closed off to somebody and you're being extremely judgmental and kind of still because you're not willing to share any vulnerability with that person. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of like hawkish when you're with them. Cause you're like, what are you trying to do now? And you're, you're, there's a vigilance that, you know, I, I guess uh, that's, that's what acting is. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, Pat and I, I, I before before I made the decision. All right, I'm going to play this role. I, we did a we did. I went over to Pat's house and we shot one of the scenes because I wanted to make sure that it physically made sense. I wanted to make sure that I felt like I could be directing and acting at the same time. And I, I you know, we had seen some great actors for the role, and and yeah, like Pat said, some of them were a little too young. Or and I also just liked the meta narrative of like we're watching the person that experienced a version of this mm-hmm. experience it, that, that was just like exciting to me. And, and if I was watching this movie, that would add another layer of excitement to the whole thing, which, which uh, it did for me in making. <clears throat> yeah. It did. When I realized it, when I started it, I just thought, who's this great actor they found. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, he wrote it too. I didn't even really know that it wasn't going to be you. I don't think I've heard. Really? No, I, I, it came to me. It was you. And I can't even imagine it not being you. I mean, either. I don't think it would have worked. I I don't think it would have worked. Part of it is that this is, I agree with you, James, too. It's so fun to watch you. I mean, obviously it's a fictionalized version to walk through this with, Patton. It's brilliant. Yeah. So it's also, it was such a gift for me. There, there are scenes we're together in where Franklin is giving Chuck nothing. He is so anti Chuck and it changed my performance. The awkwardness felt really real when you're in a scene with a, it, it, it's different. If you're in a scene with a, with a partner that's just not giving you anything because they're not present, but when you're there, there with someone who is aggressively not giving you anything because that's the character they're playing is I'm, I'm giving you nothing at you. Like as a punishment, it absolutely changes your energy. And it's so amazing. It was just, it was so amazing to, it made it so much easier to do those scenes. And Amy, for you, I mean, obviously, Patton is so charming. Is it hard to sort of be the voice of reason? And <laughs> I mean, I, I he, yes, he's also one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Obviously, he's a professional comedian, but um, but I've been around other professional comedians that I don't think are as funny as Patton. He really yes delivers. Yeah. Can we make a clip of this and just put some shit <laughs> on the tag website? Can we just do this little clip. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, but I think that really the thing I tapped into very easily because I'm a parent is like, you're going to protect your kid no matter what. And this is a kid who's literally starts the movie coming out of rehab for self-harm and it's terrifying and you would do anything to, you know, make sure that they're not going to get messed with. I also had the privilege of getting to meet James's mom before we shot and, you know, she's she loves him so completely and was such a rock during this time of his life. And I think like, that's my main purpose. So, you know, he can be as charming as he wants, but he does exactly what I'm terrified he's going to do, you know, which is do something to hurt him. And, um, you know, but then as all parents also realize, sometimes that's what gets you to the other side. And 
I do think she was married to him and knows that he's a decent human being, but he has pathological issues that aren't being treated. (laughs) (laughs) But obviously that charm was why she would ever be with him in the first place, right? He has to have that too. Otherwise, why were you ever together? You know, so it all worked for me in the script and, um, and, you know, he's, he's just, he comes up. I mean, the first time you, I think I see him in person is pulling up to take him on the trip. And it's just like, it's just like watching something, you know, is a bad idea. And James had this wonderful direction of us mirroring each other and him sort of anything I would do. He would, he would sort of, Oh, like, that's right. <laughs> I'm trying to get her to agree with me. Oh, it's, it's so awkward. I love it's that. It's that thing where you're like, this is not going to go well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> this isn't gonna go well. But um, yeah, he's yeah. It was, it was it was it's it's the dynamics are very honest, so it was easy to play. You mentioned that you got to meet James's mother. Uh, I'm curious for the rest of you, how did you sort of go about preparing for these roles? Because in some cases, James, it might it, p- people might think like, well, you're just playing yourself. First of all, you're not. Second of all, playing yourself is actually one of the hardest things Mm -hmm. to do, I've learned. Um, But I'm just sort of curious about sort of the preparation process for each of you. And let's start with James. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I'm playing, uh, I think anytime you're acting, you're playing a a specific version of yourself. You know, you're you're playing a part of yourself. I I guess that's why I think about how I think about them as like parts, uh, different, you know, I got the part. It's like, I get to play that part of myself, my like depressive, anxious, shut down part of myself. In terms of acting in my own material, I had to kind of approach it uh, like it wasn't my material. So I brought on uh, an acting coach that I've worked with for the past 10 years or so. And uh, every weekend I would spend a lot of time with him over Zoom going through the material and I would try to approach it uh, from the inside out where I'm I'm looking at the material as if it's, as, I, as if I'm the the person in the story going through it. Cause there's an, there's an innocence. I think you have to have when you're acting in something that you don't have when you're the writer director. And when you're, when it's your material, you can take a lot of things for granted uh, and go and, and intellectually understand them. Oh yeah. He's going out. He's, he's leaving. I'm coming out of a self-harm thing. I'm mad at my dad, da, da, da. but it's a different thing to really experience that in a, in a, in a felt way at, at a gut level. And it requires a lot more vulnerability and, and it's, it's tough having that vulnerability and then also trying to, uh, you know, be the head of a big crew and, you know, be, have leadership, but then also be willing to fall apart. That, that I think was a, a, a challenge uh, throughout the process. Absolutely. And Patton, for you, I, I believe, I don't want to speak for you, but I believe you didn't want to meet James's dad in advance. Yeah, I really didn't want to meet him. I didn't want to like, um, you know, get any kind of impression or imprint on him. I, I, it, this had to be, how would I myself pull this off? How would I f- try to summon the charm and the lying and the larceny uh, to pull this off? And that had to come from me. It had to feel natural. Um, if, if it was a version of someone else's, um, I don't think it would. I don't think it would have worked. It, it, it wouldn't have felt real. I, I would have. Um, I think it would have been very off putting. So, yeah, I just avoided. And then I, and I felt weird about that. But then I've heard that a lot of people. Um, a lot of actors who've played real people, they go out of their way not to meet the person or or if they're doing like a uh, playing a role that someone has done earlier, they don't watch that performance because they're like, I got to do this fresh and figure this out how I would do that. So they avoid that. So, you know, it made me feel a little better about my process. <laughs> well, then what was your process? My process was just to read the script and go over the scenes with uh, James and take a lot of, especially take a lot of the, my script has a lot of notes in the margin of what am I actually saying versus what is in this? Cause the script is basically it's all, everything I say is a, is a lie until the very not, by the way, not even the last moment it's when it's way too late that I finally admit things that, that the, 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 the point where I break down should have happened a better, a nicer person would have done that way earlier, but I'm not playing a necessarily nice person. So what am I actually meaning versus what am I saying to cover um, the petty selfish stuff that I'm doing? And that really helped a lot. Um, Cause then how do I put a nice face on this thing that I'm saying, 
which is absolute BS. <laughs> I mean, we talked about the, the the tricky tonal balance and how, you know, it can be so funny and awkward and heartbreaking and sometimes all in the same moment. Um, I'm curious specifically for, for Claudia and Patton, um, when you're taking these big swings on screen, do you know in the moment if it's working? Do you find it in the performance or maybe sometimes it's found in the editing and you just you just hope for the best? Oof. Well, I can I can say um, I don't want to speak for Claudia. I know that the sexting scene definitely worked in the editing because when we were shooting it, it was so these disconnected pieces that felt so weird. And it felt so I remember when that day was over, part of me was thinking, I don't think that's going to work that nothing. But it was that was absolutely in the editing, how that all came together perfectly. But there were other moments, especially like I, one of the scenes I felt really good about was the first time that. Chuck meets Becca. That scene felt really, really real. Um, it felt like an actual, like we were interacting as people. Um, so that that felt, so just I think you got to take it scene to scene. I think that scene. Uh, I was really excited about that one. Our first scene together too, because it needed to feel really sweet and grounded and human, because it's sort of what leads us into everything else and uh, and you know, sort of plants the seed for Chuck. So I, I agree with you that that one needed to feel really cemented. Um, yeah, and then all the other, I mean, I think I think it was all about trust. I just had an insane amount of trust in James. And um, I think what was particularly fun about Becca is I, I had a lot of room to make all these kind of big swings and and try out different things. So there are versions of each scene <laughs> that are so different <laughs> from, <laughs> from what ended up in the film because we had the time to kind of play into different versions of Becca's manipulation or version. And so, um, so I think it was like, let's just get it all on the day and let's see what's the craziest version and what's the most kind of you know, subtle and very, you know, dry version. And um, I think coming away, I sort of felt like, well, we got something. <laughs> <laughs> but we I have mean, it. Maybe I should ask James how much of this movie was found in the editing. I knew that because I was acting in it and directing, I and because we're jumping from so many different locations, I needed a really clear blueprint going into it. So I storyboarded the whole movie ahead of time. Uh, and so I was able to see how it was all going to cut together before we went in. Cause I, I really didn't want to leave that to chance uh, because it could have so easily not worked if I just chose the wrong angle or uh, if the performances didn't line up. And so I think a lot of, a lot of the, um, a lot of the coherence we found in the rehearsal process, making sure that the performances were kind of echoing one another between um, Patton and Claudia. Um, and, and then, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, it felt almost like I had pre edited the film with those storyboards. And then I had an amazing editor on the film that I worked very closely with Josh Crockett, who, uh, you know, he and I continued to discover it. And, but the, it, you know, I have the whole movie almost in graphic novel form uh, <laughs> that, I, that, I had, that I had created ahead of time. Uh, and that was incredibly useful and something I'll certainly be doing moving forward. Please release that. That would be awesome. It yeah. would be cool. Yeah. Jaded and get some colors going. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> you know, Patton knows some people in the comic book world. Maybe he can. I know quite a few that would. And, and there's also just quite a few people in the graphic uh, storytelling world that actually would love something like that or do we save it for the coffee table book down the down the line jo jodorowsky's i love my dad with all the <laughs> sketches and everything bound together <laughs> by the way i love stuff like that i have so many books movie books where they have the storyboard pages i, I could look at those forever i love stuff like that love it yeah um, you've all talked about the, the trust you placed in James and you've all worked with some, you know, amazing directors. Some of you are amazing directors, Claudia, uh, your music video is fantastic. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm sort of curious what you, 
hope for or maybe uh, hope against when you show up on a set from a director and how James sort of fostered that environment that, that you did trust him so much? Or is it or is it a leap of faith? And let's start with Amy, because I just like picking on Amy first. <laughs> <laughs> um, people love to pick on me. Always. <laughs> um, I, I, it's a leap of faith. I, I'd had a really, uh, I told, I've told James this, I, the year before I had done Cooper Rafe's shithouse for uh, South by two. And I, I had had an experience where I trusted a young kid <laughs> to run everything. And um, I knew you can tell by the way he talks about the film, how prepared he is. And um, he's incredibly rigorous. So uh, I knew I, I was in good hands. I do think like, obviously when you're on the first big project of someone, you, 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 you never really know how it's going to go. You don't, you know, um, my husband talks about that all the time. He did get out obviously with, um, with Jordan Peele and you're sort of, you know, the person's brilliant, but this is the first time they're going to really exercise this part of their right. them creatively. And you just kind of jump. But one of the things you can kind of tell is the cast and how that person has what, how they, I've actually dropped out of projects when I saw who else they casted. Cause I'm like, I don't trust that director. If they think that person's the person who that part, no, damn, joke. <laughs> no joke. Cause then I'm like, well, then artistically you're not, why you have a vision. I don't understand. Wow. So if I'm looking around and I see Rachel Dratch, Lil Rel, um, you know, Patton, Claudia, I didn't know as an actress, we have a funny thing where I had spent much of quarantine in her home because my stepdaughter's obsessed with her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I knew her uh, and how beautiful and lovely she was. But um, and boy, did she deliver as an actress. But yeah, you, you that's another thing you can gauge. Um, and like I said, his shorts, you know, you want to see something that 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 person created. And I was like, OK, I can trust him. Claudia, for you. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'm, I would say, I would say I'm still relatively new to the space. And I think this project was such a learning lesson in discovering what I like most and, and what I really enjoyed about working with James. And one of them is like, it's really refreshing and exciting when someone really knows what they want. You know, there were certain scenes that, um, I think James just knew exactly kind of to what you were saying about the story storyboarding where you were like, I know exactly the tone and how this needs to be read. Um, and having that sort of forwardness is also great because at the end of the day, he's got the vision. And, and so that was really fun to just be like, all right, let's get that. We got that. Great. Now we've got a little bit of room to play. Awesome. I think that decisiveness is, is, is great. And um, it leaves you, with time to play and um yeah that's, that's something that I, like to I don't I'm not asking you to name names or anything but have you learned um from your other directors mm -hmm. what you do want to do and what you don't want to do as a director yourself oh um I mean I think I, I feel that I've been really lucky and mm -hmm. I've worked with very kind and sweet people um and if if that's something I hopefully get to continue to do and work with others. That's such a dream of mine. Um, I think it's so much about, you know, it's your responsibility to set up the temperature of that environment and the way in which everyone communicates with each other. And um, that sort of all of the unspoken stuff, I think that is like very powerful and very um, contagious and everyone can feel it and sense it. And um, that's something that I would just hope to emulate based on what I've been able to see and experience and, and really appreciate as an actor. So I think that's the biggest one. Ben, for you. Um, I mean, I think it's a leap of faith every time, even with a great director, there are, you know, it's, it's a day to day thing and everyone, you want to feel like at least you want to let your coworkers and your director know I've, sh I'm here, I'm involved, I'm committed. I want this thing to work. Um, but uh as far as like what I've learned from, cause I've been very, very lucky. I've worked with some great directors and, and what really struck me was the truly great directors are the ones who are making the films that they most want to watch mm -hmm. the films that when they were young and growing up and watching movies, either watched a great movie, but, but then thought, why didn't they make the movie about this character or this aspect of it? And now they're making that movie. So that, 
to me, beyond technique, beyond process and craft is the initial, are you excited? Are you making a movie that you yourself would want to see? Um, and that, oh, that, 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 that's yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, Amy's worked with the Coen brothers, the Coen brothers feel like they are, they're two film nerds who grew up immersed in movies and then basically made the movies that were in between the movies that they loved going, but why didn't they do this? And that's what you're watching. And that's why their movies are so exciting and fun. So, you know, that, that, that's always the biggest lesson. And, and with James, you know, the, the fact that before we made the movie, he said, watch Bergman's autumn sonata and then watch uh, frown land. And so just to exactly. So to know that like those were his influences, that, that, but he was also so just, non-judgmental and open about these are movies that I don't get to control what affects me. So because I'm very open to that, I'm, I also don't get to control what it is that I love and want to make. I'm going to commit to that and be open to that. And that I think is what really makes a great filmmaker down the line. Sorry, James, I made you sit there and listen to everyone say night. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, I also, forgot to follow up on something, which is Pat and I mentioned you hadn't met James's father before shooting, but you guys actually have met now. We met on a Zoom call for the New York Times. And um, he he look, he seemed like a very chill, happy dude. I'm sure that, um, you know, James has had some sketchy years with him that I didn't experience, but it, it feels like the he's on the other side of the getting of wisdom and humility. And so it was, it was nice. It, it felt, it was really good to get to meet him and talk to him. And James, your dad loves this movie. So no hard feelings, right? <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's, he's into it. Uh, and I, I think he, 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 I think a lot of my humor I get from him just growing up watching a lot of Seinfeld and uh, my dad is very neurotic and is always kind of finding himself in situations and has just kind of a natural self-deprecation. to him. Um, and, you know, the movie is it, it's it's based on a circumstance and it's emotionally all true. But I took so much liberty with what actually happened and how it goes down. And so you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's not a simulacrum of, of exactly who he is and what happened. So I don't think he takes it so personally, if that yeah. makes sense. When you were a kid growing up watching Seinfeld, did you ever see the episode with the video store clerk and think that guy's going to start <laughs> like, He's a video store clerk. I just have to, I hope to work with him someday. Yeah. <laughs> the way he searched for another employee was just this oh, brilliant. Just, no, and the reason, by the way, I did that scene in two takes. And the reason that I was so relaxed was because I wasn't relaxed. I was so nervous. And Jason Alexander saw how inside my head he, I was. And right before they yelled action, um, uh, he leaned forward and goes, still not too late to be fired, Patton. And it made me <laughs> laugh so hard. And it got rid of all the tension. And I for, am forever in his debt for doing that for me. I like he gave that. me a gift. He made me laugh. I'm like, oh, okay, that's right. And then we're just having fun. Wow, that's great. I actually do very specifically remember that episode because I worked in a video store for seven years. Yes. So and, and everyone, I used to work in a video store and all my friends who've ever worked, like there's a little moment where I'm trying to get rid of them. And they're like, that's what you, you're always, <laughs> how do I hand this person off? I love that. Yeah. Well, give one a thank you all for being here. And congratulations on the beautiful movie. It's available on demand now so everyone can watch it anywhere you want. Um, again, on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, thank you so, so much for being here today. Thanks. Thanks for, for having us. Thank you so much for having us. This is so fun.